False sharing in Java is a situation that can occur when two threads running on two different CPUs are writing to two different variables which happen to be stored within the same CPU cache line, uh, which is writing to this left variable here, which will eventually get flushed all the way down to main memory. But when it writes to the left uh, to this left variable, it, the value is first written to a CPU registers, then flushed all the way down here. And thread three is doing the same thing, just writing to the right variable here, and it eventually will get flushed down through all the um, cache layers and into main memory. And the reason, of course, for this flushing is so that the two threads can eventually see each other's written values. When a CPU reads data from main memory, that data is transported up through the caches here and is kept in the caches up here for faster access for the CPU. However, the CPU does not just read a single byte at a time from main memory up into the caches here. But it, that would be very inefficient. So what it does instead is it reads a cache line, which is a sequence of bytes at a time that is being read from main memory up through the cache layers. And this sequence of bytes um, is often 64 bytes, but it depends on the underlying hardware architecture. So it could be uh, 32 bytes, it could be 128 bytes, it could be 256 bytes. That's That completely depends on the underlying hardware architecture. Sometimes two CPUs, uh, meaning two threads running on two different CPUs, might be reading and writing variables that are different, but which are stored close to each other in main memory. And when that happens, um, that means that instead of just reading this variable here, which the this thread one here is using, it reads the whole cache line, which also contains variable two. Now thread one here and CPU one does not need a variable two for anything, but thread three here and this second CPU here, they that actually needs the variable two for something. And so what happens is, um, because they are stored within what corresponds to the same cache line um, within the same 8-byte uh, address boundary here, both of these CPUs will read this whole cache line up here. So CPU 1 here, thread 1 here, they will read both variable 1 and 2 up into the caches here and get it all the way up here. It doesn't need this variable here on the right, but it uses the variable here on the left. And the same thing is true for this other CPU and the other thread here. It does not necessarily need the variable on the left. Uh, that's why it's red. However, it does need the variable on the right, which the other thread here and the other CPU does not need. So what happens then is this. When thread one writes to this variable here on the left, that uh, will, through the cache coherence mechanisms of the underlying hardware, will cause the hardware to invalidate that cache line over here, which is also stored in the CPU cache of this second CPU and, and for thread three. So basically what that means is um, thread one here changes the value from one to two. And because thread three here also has that value stored here, um, then the hardware says, oh, by the way, this value that you have stored here, which was one before it was changed to two, is now stale and you need to refresh it from main memory um, or refresh it from this other CPU cache through the cache coherence mechanisms. And that takes time. And so even if thread three here doesn't really need this value here, it is still required to refresh the entire cache line from main memory or through the cache coherence mechanism. Similarly, when thread three here writes to this write variable here, because it is stored within the same cache line, this causes the cache coherence mechanism to invalidate the um, same cache line over here in the uh, CPU caches of this CPU over here. And so as you can see, even though these two variables, the threads are using two variables which are not really related to each other and they don't need each other's values, the fact that the variables are stored uh, next to each other in main memory and thus with 
in the same cache line, whenever each thread here writes to its own variable, it causes a cache line invalidation for the other CPU. And as you can see, as these threads are running uh, very fast here, these two threads will constantly invalidate each other's caches, causing them to have to wait to get the refresh value from uh, either main memory or the um, or the L3 cache or cache coherence mechanisms. Um, and that, of course, slows down the threads here because all of a sudden they are now required to wait for a, a fresh value of a variable they don't actually need. Now let's have a look at an example of what false sharing can look like in Java code. First, have a look at this class counter1 here. It contains two volatile long count fields, and these will be used by two different threads in the following example. Here is what the example looks like. Um, let's see here. As you can see, I create a counter1 instance here and then I create another variable here which is a counter two variable it actually points to the to the same counter here so these two references here these two variables point to this same counter one object and then we set the number of iterations to one billion and that is to be sure that we can actually see the effect the performance degradation effect of the false sharing and then I create here, the example creates two threads and uh, thread one here, as you can see, will uh, use counter, the counter one uh, reference here and increment count one, the count one field. And you can see thread two here is doing the exact same thing, except it's using the counter two reference, the counter two variable and incrementing count the count two field instead. And then the threads run, they measure the start time and the end time start time end time here and then they both print out the total time it took to just increment these counters here up to one billion because counter one and counter two point to the same counter one object here the two variables point to the same object the two fields count one and count two will be stored within the same counter one instance and because of that there's a very high probability that these will be stored within uh, very near to each other in main memory and therefore within the same cache line when the uh, application is running. Now let me run this example so we can see how long time it takes for these two threads to complete 1 billion iterations, um, meaning 1 billion writes to these two variables, knowing that false sharing takes place in the background or most likely takes place in the background. I will start the example and then I will stop the recording until it's finished because it takes a little while for it to finish. As you can see down here, the threads took between 41 and 42 seconds to complete the 1 billion iterations. The, the, the time values here printed out are milliseconds. Now let's change the uh, example here so that instead of sharing the same counter one object the two threads are using different counter one objects and thus reducing the probability that um, the fields from this counter one object here are stored within the same cache line as the fields from this counter one object and then let's run the example again and see how fast it runs this time now in theory, false sharing could still take place, but in practice, most likely it will not happen. Um, and thus, as you can see here, the execution time now was only between nine and 10 seconds for these two threads. And that is because now there's no false sharing going on. I mean, the loops are still the same, right? But there's no uh, waiting for each other's uh, cache lines to be updated going on. And you can see that the execution time here is almost four times as fast as it was um, when false sharing was occurring. And that, of course, is hardware dependent, but so uh, it depends on the computer you're running it on. But as you can see on my computer here, it's about a factor of four slower when false sharing occurs.
Now, obviously, the solution to the false sharing problem that I have shown you here is a little bit artificially constructed. In a real application, if you have two threads that need to share an object, um, even if they write to different variables within the, uh, that object, if they really need to share that object, you usually cannot just make one of the threads use another object instead. Um, so what you can do instead is actually to fix the class instead so that internally in here these two fields are padded with some empty bytes so that when this object here is stored in main memory these two fields here will not be stored within the same cache line. Obviously this solution is a bit artificial because in a real application if you have two threads that need to share an object even if they don't need exactly the same variables within that object but if they need to share that object you usually cannot just make each thread use its own object so instead you will need to fix that shared object so that the fields inside it here are not stored within the same CPU cache line even if they are stored within the same object Java has a built-in annotation which we can use for that purpose. It is the contented annotation. So as you can see here in the counter to class, um, what happens is that we have annotated this field here and that tells the Java virtual machine that this field um, must not be stored within the same cache line as other fields within the same class. Now we can go back and change the false sharing example here to use counter2 instead of counter1. And uh, also here, and in, instead of using two different objects now, the two threads can use the same counter2 object and false sharing should still not occur. Now we will run this example and see how long time it takes to complete the 1 billion iterations for the two threads when the two fields within the counter to shared object here are not stored within the same cache line. And as you can see, the time is very compar comparable to when we were using two different counter one objects. And that is a, a good sign that false sharing is now no longer occurring. Now let's have a look at how you can use this uh, contended annotation. So the first way you can use it is to annotate a field as shown in the counter to class here. This means that this field that has been annotated should not be stored within the same CPU cache line as any other um, fields within objects of this class, right? So if two threads share the same counter to object, then the count one and count two fields here will not be stored within the same CPU cache line. It is also possible to annotate the whole class with the contented annotation. And when you do that, it tells the Java virtual machine that none of the fields here within this class must uh, can be stored within this uh, same CPU cache line. So count one, count two, and count three will all be stored in different CPU cache lines. It is also possible to group fields together using the contended annotation. And as you can see here in this example, I have uh, uh, provided a name as parameter to the contended annotation and that is the group name. So that means that since these two variables here, these two fields, they share the same group name, they will be grouped close to each other within main memory. Um, so they, these two fields here may now be stored within the same cache line, within the same CPU cache line. And uh, that can be useful if you know that these two variables here will be used by the same thread. However, this third variable down here, this third field is given its own group name and that means that this uh, field here will not be stored within the same CPU cache line as these two fields here. And these two fields will be kept separate from the cache line that count3 is stored within. Remember to measure your solution to a false sharing problem and not just apply the um, contended annotation blindly. Just measure the solution you had 
before you started using Contented and measure the solution that you have after applying Contented and so that you make sure that you have actually improved performance um, because it is possible that you might have used it uh, incorrectly and so the effect is not what you expected. So measure before you commit. As mentioned earlier in this video, the size of the CPU cache lines depends on the underlying hardware architecture of the computer that your Java application is running on. So that means some hardware architectures might use 64 bytes, some might use 128 bytes, some might use 256 bytes. By default though, the Java Virtual Machine pads these contented fields here with 128 bytes. But if you know that the underlying hardware architecture only in, has a cache line size of 64 bytes, then it is a waste of bytes to pad each of these fields with 128 bytes. Additionally, if you know that the underlying hardware architecture uses a cache line size of 256 bytes, then it is insufficient to pad these fields with only 128 bytes. That would cause some of these fields to still uh, be stored within the same cache line and then false sharing can occur. So in order to control how much, um, how many bytes that the Java virtual machine use as padding in between your fields, you have the option of adding a virtual machine argument here when you run your application. And this argument is called dash x x a colon contented padding width and in this case I've set it to 64 bytes but you could set it to 128 which is the default or you could set it to 256. That's it for this video about false sharing in Java. Remember to check out the description below this video for a link to a textual version of this tutorial as well as links to other related tutorials. And if you like this video, please hit the like button. And if you want to watch more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel.